All right, welcome everybody on live stream. Thank you for allowing us to uh, start a little bit late. We are so glad to have our brother Neil Silverberg here today. We're going to start with um, some worship. We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper, and then we're going to turn it over to Neil. I want to read. Let's rise for the reading of the word. Uh, I'm in John 15. John is always a safe place to start, isn't it? Amen. 15.1. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Thank you, Lord, for constantly pruning us, Lord, that we may bear the fruit of the gospel, the fruit of your grace, the fruit of your spirit and life. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me, remain in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we can abide in you, Lord, that the Father has placed us in the Son by the power of the Spirit, and we can bear fruit. We are gathering here today as fruit bearers, Lord. Not fruit bearers who might bear fruit, but fruit bearers who will bear fruit because of the gracious life of Christ that we've been given. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Lord, we just thank you this day. We turn this day over to the vine, Lord, and the vine dresser and the life that's in the vine. And we thank you, Lord, that we are branches, Lord, that have been grafted into the vine, Lord. Apart from you, we can do nothing, but as we remain in you, as we remain in Christ, as we live out uh, in faith, in Christ, Lord God, as we live it out, Lord, you say we will bear much fruit, Lord God. And Father, the, uh, we thank you that you're the one that determines the fruit, not we ourselves. We may want to do this, or we may want to do that, or we may want to accomplish this, and that may have nothing to do with your purposes for the vine, Lord. The vine speaks of harvest. The vine speaks of ingathering. The vine speaks, Lord God, of that, that time when the nations, Lord, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, when the nations come in for the mighty harvest of the Son of Man, Lord God. And so, Father, we want to be part of that harvest mission, Lord. We want to be part of the life that bears much fruit, Lord God. Uh, Lord, as verse 8 says, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Lord, we want to bear much fruit as your disciples, Lord. So grant us that as we worship, Lord God. Grant us that as we partake of the Lord's Supper, and grant us that, grant us that as we hear the word of the Lord through our brother Neil, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. We're going to partake in the Lord's Supper, and then we're going to turn the meeting over to Brother Neil. And I'm just going to go back to where we started, just to, to read again John 15. For our opening scripture, for our, our scripture for communion, for the Lord's Supper. And of course, there if you need... Uh, communion cups. They are back at the table next to the sound booth. John 15, 1. I'm the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. The work of the gospel is a collaboration between the father and the son. And of course, and it's the collaboration the father has with the son that produces the life of God, the Holy Spirit flowing through the vine. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. The Lord is 
cultivating his garden. Yahweh, the Father, is cultivating his garden, and he cultivates it. We're his garden, and he cultiv cultivates it with the focus of fruit. 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold fruit. We trust him. We trust him that if, if there are areas in our lives that are not fruitful, the Lord will take them away. We, we don't need to be threatened by God taking away things from our lives. He takes away things from our lives that, that bring us harm and that hinder the work of the gospel, that hinder the work of gospel fruitfulness. And even those that bear fruit, he prunes back. Um, I, I remember when uh, years ago when we were young and we, we had plants around the house and there'd be this beautiful wandering Jew plant and my wife would say, man, you got to cut that thing back. And I'm like, don't cut it back. Why would you cut it back? And then she'd cut it back and it would, it would multiply. It would be more fruitful. And it was just like, wow, that's what Jesus is talking about. Sometimes he even removes the fruitful areas in our lives because that's what the Father does. That's the work of the kingdom. It's how it works. You cut back so it comes back even fuller. You, you cut back one vine and it comes back as three vines. So God is good. Jesus is starting with a perspective that what his father is doing is something good. And what his father is doing is to cause us to multiply in fruitfulness. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. His word cleanses us. Whenever we declare his word, whenever we worship according to his word, when we study according to his word, when we, when we participate in the Lord's Supper and we invoke the blessings of the word of God over it, it, it cleans us. His word cleanses us. Jesus is saying, you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. You're looking for, oh, maybe one day I'll get clean. The Lord says, you're already clean because whom the Son declares clean is clean indeed. Amen. Then he says, abide in me. You know, Paul has made famous the saying, being in Christ. John's parallel statement is, abide in me. You know, different literary styles, different terminology, different audiences, different perspectives, the, the original disciples. John is writing to his community. Paul is writing to his communities. But they're saying the same thing. They're saying the same thing. Abide in me and I in you. Remain in me. Stay in me. Being in Christ. That's union with God. That's tapping into the life, a life that's outside of us. Not a life that's in us, a life that's outside of us, a life that is in the vine. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. If the, uh, the branch is broken off, the vine, it dies. As long as the branch stays connected to the vine, it lives and it lives abundantly. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him. Whoever's in Christ and Christ is in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Much fruit, not just fruit, much fruit. I Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For apart from me you can do nothing. You know, step one of the 12 steps is recognizing you're what? Powerless. And at that point, the steps are very much in alignment with the gospel. We are powerless. He is the source of power. Step two is you... You recognize, you have hope in a power outside of yourself that, 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 that is there, that has your back, that's going to make you whole, that's going to make you well. Well, at this point, like I say, the 12 steps are very gospel-like. Our powerlessness is not a difficulty for God. He, he created it that way. He's the life. He's the power. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If we don't stay connected to Christ, how do you stay connected with Christ? You stay connected with Christ. You don't make yourself connected with Christ. You've 
expressed your faith in him. That faith in him connects you to the vine. So in other words, it's just Jesus' way of saying, stay in faith, believe, trust, hope, love, rest. And, and he says, but if, if you don't do that, you're just like a vine that withers. And what are, what are our, our, I mean, a branch that withers and, and what are branches uh, that wither worthy of? Well, they're fuel for the fire. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, that's how we abide in him. We stay in his words. We simply believe his word. We believe that God is faithful, that what he's promised, he will fulfill. What he's promised, he has fulfilled. What he's promised, he will fulfill forever. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you desire and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. We bear fruit, we prove to be his disciples, and we bring glory to the Father. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So he's tying together faith He's tying together the life of God. He's tying together the concept of abiding in Christ. He's tying it together with love. He's tying it together with obedience. He ties it all together. And then he said, that is the way you bear fruit. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. These words are to bring us joy. They're to bring us joy. Now, I find it always appropriate to read John 15 for the Lord's Supper because what is the fruit of the vine? The fruit of the vine, it produces wine, it produces grape juice, it produces, it produces things that, whereby we can uh, have our, our thirst quenched. We can have our, 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 our bellies filled with bread and with wine, and we can... Rejoice in the Lord and be joyful. So, Lord, thank you for this, this time together, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your body. Thank you for your blood, Lord God. Uh, we partake of the bread. We partake of the fruit of the vine. We know this is your body and this is your blood. It's your life. And as we partake of that life, we abide in you. You abide in us and we bear much fruit. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. All right. While we're collecting the, uh, the couplets, uh, I'm going to introduce our brother, Neil Silverberg. I've known Neil for many years. Most of you in here know him, know him well. Um, some of you are new to him, and you will be blessed. You'll get to know him as well as you hear the word of God. Um, since most of you know him, and many of you who are listening in the live stream audience know him, um, I just, it's going to be a, a brief introduction. Over the course of the years, you know, I've, I've worked with many people in the gospel. I've labored with them. Our church has, has labored with many. And, you know, um, there are some simply who, when you work with them, they're exemplary. When you work with them, they are, you find out their worth, the effort. Uh, there are some, uh, you know, we, you have casual relationships, you have uh, greater than casual relationships, you have sometimes you have, end up having bad relationships. But Neil is, uh, Neil is uh, an exemplary relationship. It, it's, it's, it's an honor for me to have worked with him for many years. And how many ever, how many ever, uh, how many years uh, left we have to keep, continue to work with them? And that, of course, is something, man, never thought we'd get to that place where we're starting to number our days. But you know what? I remember my mom, shortly before she passed, she was almost 90, and she looked at me one day and she said, Michael, how did you get so old? And you know what? That's what I feel. I look around and say, Neil, how, how do we get so old? We were just we were just in the Jesus movement, you know. We were just, but you know what? Um, God is so good. The Word is rich. Most of the people 
that I consider exemplary have, have really gone home to be with the Lord, and the Lord has just blessed us so much. So the ones that, that uh, are still among us and still ministering the word and still ministering the gospel and still empowering us, uh, we, we see them as of great worth. So I'm going to introduce Neil with that. Uh, while we're talking about great worth, we are going to put uh, an offering basket on the communion table, and I want everyone in here to bless him. It, it's it, it's, it's going to go to Neil. Um, his worth, of course, is, uh, is, is beyond gold, but we, we want to encourage people toward that end. For those of you who are on live streaming and listening in, uh, we'll, I'm going to say send some finances, earmark it for Neil Silverberg, and we'll make sure uh, that he, uh, he, he gets blessed by that. I mean, we live in a world now where it's kind of like we got to consider the live stream. You're getting just as blessed as we are here. So with that rambling, <laughs> I'll turn it over to my brother, Neil Silverberg. Let's welcome him. Thanks, Oz, for the kind words. I feel the same way about you and Lord of the Harvest. Good to see you. How you doing? The multitudes came out to hear me this morning. It's good to be back at Lord of the Harvest. I usually come in July. This year it didn't work out. In July I was in Cuba. I'm working with a network of churches in Cuba, and I saw incredible things happen in our trip. It's my second trip to Cuba. Uh, I work with a network... It had 17 churches when I was there last. Now it's 30. They planted 13 more. And I took Rick Hunter with me, pastor from uh, St. Louis. We had a wonderful time. These churches so energized me. And uh, I, I, I watched Matt Abbott dance last night on the video shot in Uganda. And I thought, I could have done that in Cuba and I missed my cue. But uh, it was a great time. Shelly and I, Shelly sends her greetings. She's sorry she can't be here. The highlight of our lives this, this, at this time in our lives is the love we have for a wonderful granddaughter, Emma. Emma was born. I knew she was Jewish because recently she said her first word. I drew near and she said, trust fund. It was clear as a bell. Trust fund. And uh, she's the love of our lives. Everybody who told me, Grandchildren will change your life. It's true. And uh, she's changed our lives. And I, I'm in the busy season of travel. I'm out every weekend of this month or next month and this month. And uh, I continue to relate to Trinity. We have a leadership school that I teach at. I'm in the pulpit about every six to eight weeks. And uh, we're doing good as a church. Uh, we uh, are going to two services in September because of need for room, so it's been a blessed time. God's saving people and bringing them into the church. A lot of younger younger people, younger couples are coming into the church, so it's exciting. Uh, I want you to turn in your Bibles to John 17. In honor of Oz, I'm going to read a verse from John 17. This is familiar to you. Let me take a moment and tell you what I want to do this morning. We'll probably not be here much later than one. I'm going to have two sessions. This first session is called It's About the Mission. And the second session I'm entitling Investing in a Few. So I want to talk to you about these topics. So really, I'm talking about my life's message. This is where I'm parked recently and been there for a long time. Uh, Jesus said in John 17 in his high priestly prayer, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. John 17, 17. I'm sorry, 17, 18, I meant. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Uh, that, here's how the message paraphrases that. I want to do the unthinkable and read from the message. But it's interesting the way he translated or paraphrased that. It says, in the same way the Father gave me a mission in the world, I give you a mission in the world. Father, I know this church was 
birthed with a missional heart. I pray, Father God, that the mission would become front and center as we unpack it this morning. Help us to embrace it. Help us to uh, live in it for it. And help us, Lord God, to do the works of God. Thank you for the reading of John 15. We're reminded this morning that we can't do anything apart from abiding in you. And I thank you for that reminder. Help us to receive that in Jesus' name. In the same way the Father gave me a mission in the world, I give you a mission in the world. That's how the message paraphrases this statement of Jesus as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And behind that statement is the entire idea of the word apostle in the New Testament. Apostolos is the Greek word translated sent one. Did you know that Jesus was the first apostle? Hebrews 3 says, He's the apostle and high priest of our confession, the sent one from the Father. Because the ministry of Jesus, if you look at it carefully, was about one thing, accomplishing his Father's mission. He was sent on a mission. And all during his ministry on earth, he spoke about the mission. Remember, he said things in the synagogue of Nazareth. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to release at the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of God's favor. In dealing with the disciples' pride, you remember how he responded? For the, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And when Zacchaeus repented after Jesus had gone to his house, remember what he said? For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. Any way you look at it, the mission consumed our Lord during His ministry was the passion of His life. He came to bring the kingdom of God and eventually gave His lifeblood to make it happen. Gene Wilkes, in his excellent book, Jesus on Leadership, said this, quote, Leadership begins when a God-called person becomes consumed with a mission. Leadership begins when a God-called person becomes consumed with a mission. And I think you'll agree with me, never was that more true than it was in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, no matter what he was doing at the time, no matter what demands were made on him, he never got sidetracked from his mission. You remember when he was on his way to heal Jarius' daughter and he was interrupted by the woman with the issue of blood. And in the meantime, the, uh, the little girl died. And Jesus said, you know, to, to Jairus, do not be afraid. She does not die. She sleeps. And uh, Jesus didn't see the interruption as an interruption, but he saw it as part of his mission. And now in the upper room, Jesus prays for the disciples and for the church was about to come into being. And what is amazing is that he now invites us in his prayer to in the church to uh, us in the church to continue the mission in the same way that mission consumed Jesus so the father intends that we be consumed with mission Jesus made it very clear that if we follow him we will also be consumed with the mission remember how he told the disciples Notice his words in, John, in all three synoptic Gospels at Galilee when Jesus called them away from their fishing business. He said, follow me. Not just go to church, be religious, do Christian things, but pattern your entire life after me. Christianity is first and foremost Christological. What that means is God has really called us to follow the Son of God, to pattern our entire lives after Him. And we can do that because of what Oz read, John 15. He has brought us into vital union with Christ. What's the difference? Chris, Christendom says what God is really interested in is how you perform on Sunday. Christological means that people are really following Jesus and learning to pattern their lives after Him. Follow me is more than having religious experiences. 
It means to be totally taken up with a person. Jesus of Nazareth. Is that true? And he said, follow me and I will make you. Not so, this is not something that happens because we will it to happen. It's a miracle of grace. A miracle of grace. Why, do we have to, why does he have to make us to become something? Because we are too selfish to care about others. So he has to radically change us by his grace. Follow me and I will make you be and do what you are not in the natural. Because we're too selfish to care about others, he radically changes us by his grace. His promise is that if we follow him, he will utterly change us. And he says, follow me and I will make you become what? Respectable? Religious? Moral? No, follow me. And the one thing you will make you to become is fishers of men. That's how Jesus began their calling. And that's how he ended it at the Sea of Galilee, calling them to be fishers of men. Alan Hirsch, in his excellent book, Shaping of Things to Come, reminds us that when Jesus said he would make us fishers of men, we should not think of that in terms of fishing as we fish in the West. You know, as I saw when I lived in Florida, retirees with poles in lakes, reading the Wall Street Journal and fishing. That's not, fishing was not that way. It was fishing was done. I remember a number of years ago, me and two buddies went to Israel. And we were staying on the Sea of Galilee. And we stayed at the, uh, the YMCA on the Sea of Galilee. And we, overlooking our balcony, you could see the sea. And one morning I got up earlier than my friends and went out on the balcony to pray. And there right below me was an Israeli fishing boat with fishermen. And they were casting their nets into the water and pulling up God knows what, fish and a lot of other stuff. And that's what we would be reminded of that Alan Hirsch reminds us of in his book, that fishing was done with huge nets that they dragged through the sea. It was a very violent and messy process. And when they pull up the nets, they not only pull up fish, as I said, but probably a lot of other things as well. That goes along with my translation of the statement in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. I translate it as a city set on a hill attracts all kinds of weird insects. And I saw that firsthand. You know, how many have seen Jesus Revolution? It was like reliving our past, wasn't it? reliving our own history. It was happening here in Detroit. I was in Miami, and I was in a church of God. Sandy Fado was in that church. She had just been delivered from heroin. She hadn't even met Steve yet. And, uh, and uh, the pastor, Joe Anderson, pastored a church of God in Coconut Grove. Coconut Grove was the Haight-Ashbury of Florida. What Haight-Ashbury was in San Francisco, so was Coconut Grove. And... Uh, he looked out his window, Pastor Joe Anderson, and saw hundreds of hippies smoking dope and partying and some of them going into deeper drug use. And Joe reached out and began to pray, God, save these hippies and bring them into the church. And he did. Over a hundred got saved and attended that church of God. And the same thing that happened in Jesus' revolution happened in Miami. And that is the deacons went nuts and said, we got to have a, a, uh, a dress code and we got to we have to insist that they wear sneakers or shoes because we came in without shoes. And I don't know if Joe said this or it was attributed to him, but apparently he said, last time I checked, Jesus always catches his fish before he cleans them." God bless Joe. He lived that motto. Now let's talk about doing the mission. What does that look like? Most of the discussion in the church about the mission is around answering the question, how do we do it? What is the best method? You know, is it track distribution, relational evangelism, cell group ministry, small group evangelism? Did you notice the four little words that started the message paraphrase? of John 17, 18, it said, in the same way the Father gave me a mission in this world, so I am giving you a mission in this world in the same way. So it behooves us to ask the question, how did Jesus of Nazareth 
go about accomplishing the mission? And the answer is found in another verse I want to park at and remain at in John 1, 14. You all know it well. John 1, 14. Again, let me read it in the message paraphrase. It's the only time I've ever read from the message this much in a sermon. But it, Jesus said, the word, or John says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. It's a wonderful day in the neighborhood. That's what I think of when I read that verse. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I think this verse holds the key to understanding how Jesus accomplished the mission and how he expects us to do it as well. You know, the mission for Jesus wasn't an event. It wasn't something he did on Tuesdays from 7 to 9. The mission wasn't an event at all. When God decided to invade this world, he did so by wrapping himself in flesh and blood and coming to this planet. And when he did come to this planet, he didn't come as some unapproachable religious figure, far removed from the things that common men and women deal with. He was a real man living in a real world, dealing with real problems just as we. There's a term theologians use to describe this type of ministry. It's been called incarnational. Incarnational. That means that God invaded this world, again, not in an event, but in a person. And it, I think it holds the key for how he intends to evade the world, invade the world in the present as well through the church. Notice three things John says about the mission God sent the Son on. It was expressive. It was personal. And it was intentional. It was expressive. It was personal. And it was intentional. What do we mean it was expressive? Most of us, when we hear the word word, think of the Bible. And that's a valid use. The Bible is certainly God's word written would be the best way to describe it. But Jesus is called Logos in John 1.1. 1, 1. In, in the beginning was the Logos, the word. And we should think when we hear the term word to be biblical, we should think of uh, Jesus as the word, not merely the scriptures, although scriptures are God's word written. What is the word? What is word? When we talk about the word word, what are we talking about? It's the expression of invisible thought. I'm thinking of a word right now. Would you please tell me what it is? Come on, tell me. You can't because word is invisible. The word was dog. And not until you hear the word expressed do you understand, right? So, uh, in the same way God expresses himself through Jesus of Nazareth. What is important to realize by the designation word for Christ is that God is an expressive God always interested in revealing himself. That's what word implies. Because even before the word came into this world, God had been speaking to human beings. In fact, he spoke to the first man and woman uh, ever to live on this planet. In the truest sense, he is the great communicator, always looking to express himself. He, who he is, what he is doing, he is always wanting to show people. Uh, the church, in fellowship with the word, now carries out the expressive nature of, uh, of God. No one voted on whether the word should come into the world. And it, isn't, it wasn't a human decision. It was exactly how God planned it. The word Christ is now in the church. That means that the church, like God, should always be looking to reveal the Son. And that's why the message of the church is Jesus Christ. We should be passionate about God revealing His Son. You know, I really saw this in a passage I read in Isaiah 65 years ago when I was ministering in Florida. It, you remember Isaiah says, God says through Isaiah, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a no nation that did not call on my name, I said, here am I, here am I. Of course, this great prophecy is, is focused on the inclusion of the Gentiles in the redemptive history. But it's true to read now in that God continues to seek out those who are lost 
And he chooses people that don't even know they're being chosen. There are people today in Detroit who God wants to reach, who aren't looking for God or Christ, but God wants to surprise them. The word became flesh and blood. Not only is it expressive, it's personal. When God sent the word to this planet, why did he have to send a human being? Why not send a tape recorder so there could be no chance of missing the message? Instead, he sent an ordinary human being, ordinary in one sense. He was Jesus of Nazareth. He had a town he belonged to. He spent many years in a carpenter's shop. That meant that when he started his ministry, someone inevitably must have said, I know him. He built my coffee table. And remember when he started his ministry in Galilee, people were shocked when he came to his hometown and went to the synagogue. No one said, there's no record of anybody saying, I knew it. I knew he was different. Rather, they said, where did this man get this? We know him. He's Jesus of Nazareth. His sisters and brothers live here. When people, when he began his ministry, people were shocked. Because he was so ordinary. He said, they said, is this not the carpenter's son? And what does that mean for the mission of the church? It means God uses ordinary humanness to reveal his son. The incarnation means that God in Christ was not inviting people to an event, but inviting people to the ordinary, into the ordinary life of an ordinary man. Ordinary in one sense. And when we talk about being a missional church, reaching out to others, we must also almost always connect it to an event, a program, a something that is evangelistic. But from God's point of view, evangelism, being missional, is about normal human lifestyle. You know, when Jesus began his ministry, what did he do? First, he told some people who were following him to hang out and see with me. And then he went to a wedding. Then he went to the temple, which every Jew was required to go three times a year. Then he talked to a woman at the well. Jesus demonstrates that God reveals himself in the normalness of life. One author said the church has to come to terms not with Christ's divinity, but with his humanity. And I think that's very true. In other words, it's not so much that we need to invite people into our church as we need to invite people into our lives. You know, I found out something. God is comfortable in human skin. He is very comfortable in human skin. Human life, with all of its frailties, is the perfect conduit for God. And in this regard, you can be used of God and not even know it. Years ago in Knoxville, I needed help with my Macintosh computer. So I went to the Apple store in our town. There was an Apple store owned and run by a man named Dusty. And he was a Macintosh specialist. So I had to make many trips. And I started hanging out with Dusty. And Dusty, uh, you, you know, whenever I went in the shop, I knew he just blew a joint because you could smell it across the store. But he loved me, and we, we started hanging out together. And one day I came into the store, and Dusty said, uh, Hey, Neil, i got to tell you something. I said, What? He said, I quit smoking cigarettes. I said, Great, that's a nasty habit. He says, No, you don't understand. Come here. And he grabbed my arm, pulled me out of the store, and said, I want you to know I gave my life to Jesus, and you're the main reason. And I remember standing there, and my first thought was, Did I ever formally witness to him? I had no recollection of doing the formal Romans road or doing the typical evangelistic, but I hung with him and the Jesus in me was visible to him and he decided he wanted Jesus. And he, he does all, all of our internet stuff to this day in my podcast, Dusty. It was a lesson for me to remember that God is perfectly comfortable in human skin and it's a perfect conduct, conduit for the gospel. And not only is it, is, he, is it expressive and personal, but Jesus, the verse said in the paraphrase of the message, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Jesus was intentional 
about why he had come to seek and save that which is lost. You know, I've been praying for a door to open in my subdivision. I uh, prayer walk my subdivision constantly. And recently, I met a guy named Andrew who lives in my subdivision, began sharing the gospel with him. And we went up into my office in my home. And I, I said, let me read to you. Uh, are you born again? He said, yes, I think I'm born again. I said, let me read you a description. I read him several verses from 1 John. He looked at me and said, I don't think I'm born again. And he's been coming to Trinity. And, uh, and I, I just met him. And, and we related together because we live in the same neighborhood. It means, you know, Jesus was intentional about why he came. He said to seek and to save that which is lost. That's why he came. That meant to accomplish his mission. He had to enter the lives of people. He had to enter the neighborhood. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. And I thought about it recently. I I needed to really get to know my neighbors. But I said, I excused myself. I said, uh, well, I can't. I'm too busy serving God. But how many know for the life of Jesus, entering the the lives of neighbors was his purpose. It was the reason he came. That's what serving God was for Jesus. And this has incredible implications for how we do church. So often the church functions under what is called the attractional model. You know, the attractional model. If you build it, they will come. Build the perfect church with all the bells and whistles and programs, and they'll come. And uh, meanwhile, most new church plants in America start by attracting Christians from other churches. It's a fact. You know, Jesus gave two commands in the gospel, in Matthew's gospel. Come unto me and go. And uh, in commanding us to go, he gave us our life's mission. So I want to read from Matthew 28. This is the second thing I want to turn to, which is, it's about the mission. This is called investing in a few. And do you guys need a break or you want me to just continue going on till about one? Can I keep going? Okay. Matthew 28. Familiar words, but let's read them with virginal ears. Verse 16. Now the 11 disciples. Oz, give me that white notebook there, please. Thank you. If you touch it, it's, it's, it's going to transmit holiness. Matthew 28, 16. Well, to the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I usually, when I share this message, show a chart on the overhead. I don't have it with me. But it's a chart of a friend of mine's ministry. And what it is, uh, it shows his spiritual offspring. A friend of mine named Gordon is in full-time ministry in Knoxville. Uh, he works with navigators. And it's, I show the chart of his spiritual offspring. He's a man I met years ago. Uh, and Gordon was an older man who spent the majority of his time uh, finding young men and poor. I never heard him preach, but he had a slew of young men that he found and poured his life into. And he, and I, I heard stories about the way he had affected lives in our city. And when I met him, I could understand why. And Gordon told me a story I will never forget about his ministry. And it's reflected on the chart. He spent time pouring himself into two men who were not Christians, and he brought them to faith in Jesus. And he discipled them 
to uh, themselves go and multiply. And uh, those two men he originally brought to Jesus ended up moving out west. And a number of years later, they sent him a plane ticket and said, we want you to meet someone. We're flying you out here. And Gordon personally told me how he went out, and I think it was in Colorado, and he was picked up at the airport and driven to a house. And there were 60 or 70 people in the house. And they said to the original two, said, we want you to meet your spiritual offspring. So when I showed the chart, I showed the two guys that were affected initially from Gordon, and those two multiplied into two. And that multiplication brought about 70, 60, 70 people. And he, he met his spiritual progeny, his spiritual offspring. The question is, what does your chart and my chart look like? What are the names of the people that you are pouring into and are they multiplying themselves in others? This commission has been rightly called the great omission because in our zeal to obey it, we haven't actually read it. <laughs> it's an actually a repeat of the original mandate, the original dominion mandate to be fruitful and multiply. Adam and his offspring were to fill the world with offspring, be fruitful and multiply. Adam, uh, you know, was given that original mandate, but now it's been reissued to the church. We are to go and multiply ourselves. Remember, the mandate had three parts. Bear God's image, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth. Bear God's image, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. That's what the commission is about. People who bear the image of Christ are constantly multiplying disciples who are multiplying disciples until the earth is filled with people that love Jesus and the earth has changed. Look at the commission. First of all, it says all authority, Jesus says, in heaven and earth is given to me. Jesus has now been invested with sovereign authority over this universe. A disciple is a person who first lives under the authority and recognizes the sovereignty of Jesus. And if he is a sovereign, he has the right to commission me. Right? What he is telling me is not a suggestion or an idea, but a commission from the sovereign Lord. The second thing we notice is he says, uh, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore is the next phrase. It's important to point out that the word go in this text is not the imperative verb in the sentence. The emphasis is not on the word go, but on the word make. So you could, the Greek phrase could be expressed, while you are going, make disciples. It presupposes that we're going to be going. How many of you are going to work tomorrow? or not tomorrow, it's Sunday, or Monday. How many will go to work? How many will go to school? We're all going. So we're going to the supermarket. And Jesus, that word in Greek could be expressed, while you are going, make disciples. It's not a matter of should, you know, we've limited these words to foreign missions and sending people into the world. And that's a valid application for certainly it includes that. But it means more that we are to make disciples as we go through the normal aspects of life. I'll never forget one day I took my kids, we homeschooled our boys, and I took them to the post office. And we were in line to get stamps. And a woman who was demon-possessed behind me, it began, the demon started manifesting in the post office. And my kids were like, what's going on, Dad? I said, nothing, just a normal day at the office. <laughs> Let's cast it out and go. And... Uh, The simple word go tells us the nature of the mission. As God the Father sent Jesus Christ into the world, so Jesus now sends us into the world. And it tells us that the church is essentially an apostolic community. It's an apostolic community. A friend of mine, Jim McCracken, had a message once that was entitled, If you're a disciple, you're out of here. And he didn't mean you need to leave the church. It meant that your real ministry lies behind the four walls of the church. Amen? 
So we need to start thinking not only in terms of how can God use us in here, but how can God use us? How can I have maximum influence out there? Go means I'm called by Jesus Christ to have influence beyond the walls. And this is difficult for a lot of us because we become comfortable in the church. Uh, I wouldn't say you, you've been made comfortable under Oz, but, but it's true that many churches, people feel comfortable in the church and they're reluctant to leave the comfort of the church to confront the world. But that's where our real ministry lies. Jesus himself recognized that most workers involved in the harvest are reluctant ones. Do you know in Matthew 9, 35 through 38, where Jesus said, you know, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. I never looked up the Greek word translated send there. I assumed it was apostolos or one of the derivatives of it. And I was shocked one day that I did look at it and it was ekbalo. It was not uh, the apostolic word apostolos. It was ekbalo, which is the word in Greek translated in the English Bible, cast out regarding casting out demons. I've never delivered somebody from a demon where the demon said, where have you been? I want to get out of here. No, you have to cast them out violently. Right? And that's the same word that is used by Jesus. Ekbalo. Pray the Lord of the harvest. It's also translated kick out. So, the Lord of the harvest to kick out workers into his harvest. Which implies what? Workers are reluctant to leave the comfort of home and go out. They have to be kicked out of the nest. So we're going to have a kicking out service at the end. <clears throat> and let's be clear on the commission. Jesus said, do we have any water? Give me my bottle. Just right there is good. I got it. Thank you. That's mine. Thank you. The commission is to make disciples. <clears throat> disciples have to be made. They're not born. And how do we do this? We do this the same way Jesus did it. By entering the lives of a few in order to have maximum input. That's why I've entitled this Investing in a Few. I've always asked this question. Why, if Jesus was trying to reach as many as possible, did he not organize his followers into a mass movement? Why didn't he use his popularity to get what he wanted? In fact, what we actually see is Jesus having a healthy and appropriate skepticism of the masses. Why? Why was he skeptical of the crowds? Because I think he knew that the same crowds who would praise him on the triumphal entry to Jerusalem would be yelling later, crucify, crucify him. And Jesus actually did minister to the crowds, but he did so to call people out of the crowd. You weren't a disciple because you were in the crowd. You were a disciple so that God could call you out of the crowd and follow Jesus. Yet in spite of Jesus' clear strategy of calling people out of the crowds and focusing on a few, most leaders today continue to rely on preaching and teaching to the masses to make disciples. It doesn't work essentially because discipleship partly is a relational process. Now, preaching is effective in pointing people to the need for discipleship, but these same people must come out of the crowd and be discipled. So for Jesus, success in ministry meant he must enter the lives of a handful of men in order to have maximum input, impact. For Jesus, discipleship wasn't a program, but a relationship. In the context of that relationship, he shaped the lives of 12 men who subsequently changed the world. I think there are two reasons Jesus did it this way. One is called internalization. The other is called multiplication. Internalization and multiplication. Internalization means if Jesus' purpose was to make sure that his kingdom 
and a message outlived his earthly ministry, he had to have a core of people who knew in depth his person and mission. They had to be a group who internalized his message. Remember how this worked? He spoke the parable of the sower and the 12 disciples asked him later at the house, what in the world did that mean? And he was able to explain it to them. Many, many times in Jesus' public ministry, you're aware that he, uh, you know, it, his public sessions were file, file, followed by a private session with the 12. When the disciples argued over who is the greatest, he was able to expo expose their false value system and give them a new model of the kingdom. If you think about it, this is the only way that Jesus himself preserved his legacy. He never penned a book or entitled, enlisted a scribe to record all of his words and works, although the disciples wrote accounts we call four gospels. In fact, he, for the most part, he depended on two means to preserve his legacy. The Holy Spirit and the twelve. F.F. F. Bruce, the scholar F.F. F. Bruce, said it best. This careful, painstaking education of the disciples secured that the teacher's influence should be permanent, that his convict kingdom should be founded on deep and indestructible convictions in the minds of a few, not on the shifting sands of superficial impressions in the minds of many. Let me read that again. The careful, painstaking education of the disciples secured that the teacher's influence should be permanent, that his kingdom should be founded on deep and indestructible convictions in the minds of a few, not on the shifting sands of superficial impressions in the minds of many. The other reason he focused on entering the lives of 12, as I said before, was multiplication. It's the fact that Jesus focused on the twelve. Is it evidence that he was unconcerned with the multitudes? Not at all. Jesus didn't think like we did. We think that in order to reach multitudes, we need to have public events and invite the crowds. There's a place for that. But Jesus had a different vision. He had a big enough vision to think small. And because of his vision for the multitudes and his compassion for them, he gave himself to the twelve. Eugene Peterson, the author of the message I've been quoting, uh, he said, said it best, quote, Jesus, it must be remembered, restricted nine-tenths of his ministry to 12 Jews because it was the only way to redeem all Americans. <laughs> Jesus, it must be remembered, restricted nine-tenths of his ministry to 12 Jews because it was the only way to redeem all Americans. The irony is that by focusing on the multitudes, we have failed to train people who the multitudes can emulate. And we often perpetuate superficiality by casting a wider net. It is wide without being deep. Without exception, the men that I meet with regularly, I have a slew of men in our local church that I meet with and teach theologically. And when I hear them saying, this has meant more to me, not because of me, but it has meant more than me than the hundreds or thousands of sermons I've sat under. And their lives have been changed in the context of relationship. Jesus' vision was to impact the lives of 12 so they could multiply themselves and others. He had to first make sure that the people, that, that he had people that the crowds could emulate actually. So let me give you five steps, I think, that you can begin to implement. Six. What should I do? How can I, what steps can I begin to take to become a person whom God can use to multiply disciples? Here's some practical steps. First of all, dare to be a disciple. Let's be clear on what that means. It doesn't mean perfection, but it does mean uh, you're a learner, someone passionate about learning to love and to follow Jesus. That means that the disciple is the person that is actually practicing the things that Jesus taught. And then a disciple is a person who has a deep desire that God use them 
to powerfully affect other lives. Because of their love for Jesus, they want Jesus to use them to draw others. We call it evangelism, but it begins with a burden in the heart, not just a sense of obligation. Again, I was prayer walking my neighborhood when a guy I had met who has a lawnmower business in our subdivision was playing horseshoes with his brother and he, yeah, on the lawn. And he said, Neil, come, we're playing horseshoes. I haven't played horseshoes in so many years. I said, well, I can't. I'm finishing my walk. And I walked about another 10 minutes and I heard the Holy Spirit rebuke me. You've been asking for an open door to reach your neighborhood and I'm opening it. Go play horseshoes with them. And I did the unthinkable. I played horseshoes. Did pretty good. Number two, step number two, take note. Take stock of your present relationships. Do an assessment of the people who are in your life right now. Remember, you don't need to go anywhere else to be a disciple maker. God has given you people in your own oikos, your own household, your own sphere of influence. There are people that you can enter their lives uh, and impact for the gospel. These are people that you have uniquely uh, or been ordained to reach. I had a man call me once from our church, said, Pastor, come down. I'm at a bar. I got a guy that wants to receive Jesus. And I said, no, you, you met him. You lead him to Jesus. Everybody has people in their sphere that they can influence for the gospel. Number three, pray about who the Father might want you to disciple. Don't invite people into your life lightly because it's a huge commitment. Remember when Jesus spent the whole night in prayer to God? Of course, that was to choose the, the 12, which were essential to their, his redemptive plan. But that's what he did. He sought God the entire night to make sure the ones he had chosen were the right ones. You might be naturally drawn to someone that God might have someone at first choice you're not drawn to. As I look at the slew of men I'm working with, some of them I would not have chosen, but they turned out to be the most teachable and hungry for the things of the gospel and to learn theologically. Ask the Father to make it very clear to you who it is you're to enter their lives. And then step four, invite them into your life. It's not so much inviting people to a Bible study, although we study the Bible or a church service, but you're invited into their life. The first thing Jesus said in John when the disciples, uh, Andrew and John, I think it was, were following Jesus. They were disciples of John the Baptist and Jesus and John pointed and said, behold, the Lamb of God and they left John and went to follow Jesus. Remember what Jesus did when he saw them following? He turned around and said, what do you seek? He said, Rabbi, where do you live? And essentially said, hang out with me, you'll learn. And the first thing Jesus did is hang out with some men and disciple them. So you can do the same. Come and see. You know, so often the following scenario occurs in the local church and it, an attempt in an attempt to fill various ministry positions, it meets with continued frustration because no one's stepping up to the plate. And uh, so the pastor and elders call a committee together to come up with a discipleship program. The committee is formed. They scour the land to find a discipleship program that has proven successful, which usually means they're looking for curriculum and a system that can produce disciples. They find the program, it's implemented with great expectations, yet it all comes crashing down when only a few people even sign up for the program. And the ones that do are, for the most part, those who are already among the overcommitted. The end result, sadly, is that the size of the ministry base is substantially the same as it was before the program was initiated. What is missing from this approach? The priority of relationship. The priority of relationship. Curriculum is good, but for transformation to occur, it can only happen in the context of relationship. I'm not demeaning the importance of teaching and teaching sound doctrine, but it's in the context of the relationship where it is best taught and impact, lives are impacted. 
Jesus said to the 12 again, follow me, come into a relationship with me and I'll empower, empower you to fulfill what I've called you to do. The same appeal is at the heart of disciple making. Again, how does this approach differ from church programs? It differs. We're not inviting people into a program or a curriculum where they study material, take exams and turn it in. Although I do that as a teacher in our school. Instead, they're invited into accountable relationships of love, transparency, and trust. And then step five, teach them how to follow Jesus because it's in the context of loving relationships of accountability and transparency that we make disciples. Certainly we can use material, but again, the person learns best through relationship. It's been said, discipleship is caught, not taught. Caught, not taught. One of the reasons discipleship is so powerful is God can use it to model, to help live the Christian life. You learn to walk with someone as they walk through the various stages of their Christian life. I think discipleship is still the missing jewel in the church and we need to recover it. And then six, step six, teach them to multiply. Don't merely allow them to enjoy the relationship with you, the discipler, but teach them to multiply and make that the norm. Go and make disciples. We showed on the back of our church bull in one Sunday uh, a, a box where you put in the names of the people you're praying about discipling and pouring into. And we pray, we, in our small groups, we pray together with the people as they bring the names forward. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. Father, I pray, Father God, that we would begin to invest in few people. Let the people in this room, Lord God, invest in lives. Thank you, Father, that we're called to do this, that this isn't just a good idea, but you said, go, therefore, and make disciples. Lord, continue to make Lord of the Harvest a disciple-making church and give us an investment in those who are ready to, to move to maturity. In Jesus' name, amen. Anybody have any questions? The floor, the floor is open. Yes. Number four. Repeat number four. I got to look it up myself. I don't remember what four was. Four is invite someone into your life. It's about praying about who should you should walk with. <laughs> Hold on, brother. We're going to get a mic. I guess we're taping these questions, so thank you for your patience. Okay, Neil. Um, <clears throat> like at the job, you know, I, I only get a certain amount of time to deal with men and women right. at my job. Okay, so I, you know, I, I witness to them, share with them about the love of Christ, um, and so on. And then we go home, you know. But what I've been running into is it seems like they want, they want help or they have a question for that time. And then when I give it to them, it may be, a, a, it may be seem difficult to them or whatever for them to read 
or to pray or to study, mm-hmm. and and they seem to fall away. They, I work in Auburn Hills, so that's miles from here, and then they live the same amount of distance that the, my job is from here, and so it's kind of hard for us to link up. But what 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 should I do? Well, there's two things I would recommend. Number one, and these are important. Uh, you know, I said to a man. I said, do you ever share the gospel at work? He said, no, I don't talk anymore because no one wants Jesus. I've worked there 20 years. I said, did you ever have anybody over from work for dinner? And he stared at me like an unbelief, going, of course not. I, I wouldn't do that. They curse. They, they drink beer. So that's when I said to him, from borrowing it from Joe Anderson, last time I checked, Jesus always catches his fish before he cleans them. So build relationships so that you can engage people outside. Then there's the theological issue of making sure you're discerning who the Father's drawing. You know, the Father's drawing some, and they're at different stages in being drawn. So sometimes they're not ready for full gospel on. You know, sometimes it's just hanging with them and being friendly and being uh, pleasant to be with. And looking for that opportunity later down the road to share the gospel. So don't feel like you're failing if you didn't get a full-blown opportunity. Building relationships and friendships towards a view of making disciples is an important part of the process. And that doesn't mean you go in with guns blazing, preaching the gospel all the time. It means you just become a friend, become a, someone that's pleasant to be with. Someone, you know, I, I have taken sometimes a year before I've felt comfortable enough to share the gospel with someone I've been reaching out to. And I, I used to think, until I get that chance to preach the gospel, I'm failing. But no, that's not it. Building friendships and relationship, because discipleship is all about relationship, is an important part of the process. So don't think of it as failure. Think of it as opportunity. Okay, amen, amen. That's good. Now, I've got one more. Now, I have four children. Um, two of them are adults. Two of them what? Two of them are adults. Okay. You know, they're 20 and 21. Mm-hmm. The other ones, the other two are 16 and 14. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I, I give them the word, and we talk and we kick it all the time. And But I eased up off of them a little bit because, I, you know, the Holy Spirit just told me, don't, don't go in blazing. Right. But here's the deal, though. Give me some advice on the a continual uh, conversation that can go on. Now, we can have it today, and it might not happen for another week or so. The key, the key there is to pick your moments. You know, I have a son that's uh, working on his testimony, so I understand that. And, okay. uh, you know, just look for yeah. those moments that the father provides. Like I had a recently a discussion with my oldest son and, it, you know, he, you have to engage him at, at the proper time and it just was an opportunity to share. And you don't go in guns blazing every day, but you look for those opportunities. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Anybody else have any other questions before we shut it down? I'll be here in the morning. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you for your attention. God bless. We aren't going to have a break, so we're going to we're, we're going to take up a collection for Brother Neil. If uh, Jerome or somebody can uh, pass the plate, and uh, let's close with a, a word of prayer here. This, of course, Lord, just bless, Lord, the finances, Lord, to support our brother in the 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 missional apostolic work that he's doing. Lord, open up our hearts, Lord, to give, Father, in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just we take the word of mission, we take the word of discipleship, we take the word and, and we simply say, Lord, show us, Lord. We're, we're here at the letter B, and, and Neil's exhorting us to go to D and E and F. Lord, show us how, how the next step, Lord. Step C, 
Lord, to facilitate, Lord, what we're already doing in terms of discipleship here. And, Lord, add to it, Lord God, just divine strategies, Lord, uh, to embrace what Neil has shared, to see what Jesus did and is doing in our midst, O oh God, and to continue, Lord, to increase that fruitfulness that we talked about in John 15, Lord God, to increase that fruitfulness in going and making disciples, Father. We ask this, Father, in Jesus' mighty and precious name. Amen.